sometimes I really don't know how to tell people this, but I've really done some bonehead moves. <laughs> no, really. I mean, I've done some whoppers. <laughs> Woo! Boy, were they some goodies. <laughs> but you see, I laugh about it. Not everyone does that. Not everyone treats their life quite the same. Now, of course, we all have that habit of, you know, knowing that uh, we are not perfect. And lots of times you'll hear in the gospel more of a forgiveness in wanting someone to come to Jesus in order to be forgiven. But then the odd thing happens when a person comes to God is that somehow the believers that are with that person suddenly hold that person to a higher standard. You know, they want to place them and make them into some kind of creation that God never intended them to be. The bluntness, the truth of what that false doctrine is, it's kind of like a righteousness. You know, it's a doctrine of righteousness and it's kind of a doctrine of perfection. It's where you don't let people fail and you're supposed to let people fail. To put it bluntly, you let them fail so they can succeed. Because as we are told in secular world about so many different heroes that we have, you know, they failed at this and failed at that and failed at this and failed at that, and then they succeeded at whatever it was. Well, to put it bluntly, that's what Christianity is. You're going to fail miserably, regularly, over and over again, because you're not perfect. You have to get to a place where you recognize that where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And that you're not going to win all these battles with your flesh, much less with other people, or with your church, or with doctrines, or with dogmas, or with theology. There are times where you're just going to get stomped on and romped on. I mean, to put it bluntly, the bullying pulpit is called the bullying pulpit because people beat up on you. I mean, they do a smackdown and they do a beatdown that you think, my God, is this what God said for love? Well, no, he didn't. And that's why the false doctrine is out there, you know, is that there's so many false teachings of somehow discipling people into trying to make them into legalists and somehow that they can point the fingers at each other and tell each other, oh, you're in sin, brother, you better not do that. Or worse than that, when the opposite extreme of this reverse engineering, kind of like, oh, you can't judge me. Well, you know, you, you could judge them, you know what I mean, to put it bluntly. Like, I could judge you, but whatever way I judge you, I'll be judged. So, I'd rather give you grace, to put it bluntly, because if I extend grace to you, I'm given grace. So, personally, I can judge you any way I want to. But God knows I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I choose a more excellent way. And that's where letting people fail, you have to recognize who you're talking about, what you're talking about, and where you're coming from when you're talking about some of these issues like righteousness or perfection or discipleship or in sin or out of sin or practicing sin or doing sin or you know where you're, you're really kind of you know, meeting rubber meets the road. A person who has an attitude of not wanting to sin, but does, has the right attitude. The person who feels broken and contrite because of their sin has the right attitude. The person who feels as though they do not sin, or that they somehow are above that, has the wrong attitude. The person who points the finger and points out sin has the wrong attitude. You see, people aren't called the convictors of sin, the Holy Spirit is. We're not told that you know, you're supposed to run around and point out everybody's flaws and faults. If anything, we're told the person themselves knows what their faults are. And that if you are part of a congregation that tries to hide it, look around. I hate to say it, but you know, in Christianity today, it's pretty obvious that everybody's sin is being revealed and is being shouted from the mountaintops, like Jesus said. If you just trust in Him to bring about, there is no sin that will not be revealed that God will make it very evident and very obvious to those around them. And that's part of what this false doctrine fails to acknowledge. The reality that, like Peter, we will fail. 
We will make mistakes. Whether you have the Holy Spirit or not, whether you think you're walking in the Spirit, led by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, and you know you're doing your thing. I hate to say it, most people that I meet that tell me that they're walking in the Spirit usually are so full of pride, I don't want to have to deal with them. You know, because quite frankly, they tell me in five sentences what they are, and all of a sudden I'm realizing that, you know what, I have to deal with their self-righteousness because you can see in their sentence structure some of the things that they're saying. And it's like, no, you know, you're a sinner. That's all you are. You know, if the Holy Spirit uses you, great. You know, other than that, you're a sinner saved by grace like everyone else. There's no greater, there's no lesser. And so, we as Christians have to look at each other and recognize our faults and failings. We have to say to each other, yes, you will fail. It's okay. Yes, you will be forgiven. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can be made into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ who forgave sins. And it was as though Jesus had sinned no, none at all. And people say that all the time. You know, and I kind of go, well, yeah. You know, I mean, there's a couple places where I kind of debate that. But, you know, we'll, we'll go with perfect and righteousness because... You know, according to one man's thing, it might have been sin. According to another person, well, of course not, because he's the one who wrote it. But you know, we don't want to get into those kind of theological questions. But in the doctrine and dogmas of this kind of like righteousness of mankind, then that's when man tries to make kind of righteous attitudes and actions about people that man cannot live up to, and that's where we fail miserably when we don't give grace and extend grace and be merciful and give mercy when we don't forgive and be forgiven. In all these things, we've been made more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us because of that death that Jesus went through, that suffering that he endured on the cross, that beatings and that chastisement for our peace that he was placed in the garden of and went through as well as later in the beatings that he took upon the pavement when they tortured him and they beat him for our healings. Chastisement of his peace was upon him. That peace was peace with God. That meant that we can't have an assurance that we are failures, yes, but we are God's failure that he's making into a success because in failure we can be made righteous because we will be imputed a righteousness we could never attain to. Perfection. We can never attain to be perfect. So we need to lighten up on each other and lessen up on our theology so that we begin to let others fail. I like to say it this way. If Peter walked into your church today, would you accept him or reject him for all the things that he said and did? I mean, after all, he denied Jesus Christ three times. <laughs> You're out of here, dude. You know, I hear it all the time. People write things on the Internet. You know, they'll say... Oh, well, you better post this because if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before the Father. Hey, I got news for you. I have denied Jesus in front of people, and I have no problem admitting that. Yes, I have done that at times. In some settings or some situations, I've gone, you know, remain silent or, you know, like, you know, ask directly, are you a Christian? No, not me, man. I'm not one of those. But the reality of what happens when you do that, is where you are in what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. Did you feel bad about it? You did? Good. Wonderful. You failed. Now you have the remorse that God wants you to have so that you're not hardened of heart. You're being tenderized because you were placed into a trial and a situation and circumstance that was meant to train you, not to derail you. In other words, train you not like the choo-choo, but to make you into a locomotive so that you could endure throughout this life all the fiery trials that are going to happen to you. You will be put into situations where you won't deny your Lord. You won't deny anything. You'll be there and you just go, yeah, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm a Christian. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect, but, you know, I teach. Yeah, you know, I'm not perfect, but this is, you know, what God has done. He's forgiven me. You, know? you just share the reality of what God has done through the experiences of your life as you've learned the Word of God to make them applicable in your life. And that's how doctrines get blasted away and get lost and put away, finally, if you don't go into the schools of theology and try to become some kind of like, you know, intellectual theologian. Because, I don't know about you, but I keep meeting some of my peers 
some of the men of God that I grew up with, you know, I mean, I don't like to even say their names in this case, you know, when it comes to doctors, because quite frankly, I find them failing of the grace and mercy with which Jesus had brought them into salvation because they don't know what they're talking about because they went to school to get some kind of degree. And so they've added to it a systemic kind of theological perspective that they put God in a box so that they can operate according to some fallacious ideas about what God is, how God is, and how God operates. I'm sorry. I'd rather talk to God about how he operates than talk to men about what they think they know. And that's where I go to God always with James 1.5. I say, you know, Lord, I don't know. You know, that sounds like a bunch of bull to me. What do you think? You know, God says, no, I didn't say it. I'm like, okay. If you didn't say it, then it ain't so. And that's what I find true about scriptural and biblical theology. Most of the theology I hear when people start telling me about how they've got some statement of faith, they base it on, and they'll, they'll give me a list of 20 scriptures of what it's based on. But if it isn't what the scripture said, I'm not interested. Because it's just a summation, they're saying, of something that they put together and put the pieces in where it may not be the fullness of the counsel and the wisdom of God in the operation of an individual person's life in dealing with them and the grace and mercy that he's extended to them because of what Jesus has done on the cross for their sin. And if I can't use the same scriptures, even though I may be sentencing them in a different way, then I don't want to hear what men have to say because I can do the same and create all kinds of intellectual, theological statements that sound so important that they really are stupid. I mean, to put it bluntly, if you cut through the garbage, that your yes be yes, that your no be no. Keep it simple, stupid. You know what I mean? Those are some ideas, I admit, but one of them is what Jesus said. Yes is yes and no is no. It's that simple. Stick with the reality of what God says in his word, and you don't have the complexity of what man tries to do by saying about his word. It's better to do and to be and to see what the Word of God is saying than to be about what men are comparing or daring or sharing about the Word of God. I would rather follow Jesus as the Word of God than to follow men any day. Now, I'll admit, there's some men that they get it. They got it. And it's good. <laughs> and I love it. They'll say things to me like, well, that's not that's not how the Father operates. And I'll go, as soon as they use the word Father, my ears perk up. I'm like, huh? Father? Ooh, they know God. Because there is this theology kind of idea that out there that they want to throw things at you that sound, ooh, holy, when in reality we're talking about what Jesus said was personal. Jesus talked about a personal individual he knew intimately. Jesus related this person that he had great union with and oneness with, and it was his Father in heaven. Now, what that means, I don't know. There's so much I don't know, and I'm not even going to go there. You know, It's like, hey, don't tell me you understand the unity of the Godhead, you know, the Father, Son, and Spirit, and don't tell me it works perfectly in your mind. Baloney. No, it doesn't. It's impossible because it's a reality that we don't know. But it is a existential being that is greater than our comprehension. And that's what God has already said about himself. I am that I am. You don't know what I am, but I am. Uh, well, all right, I'll go with that one. You know, I can deal with that. And that's why, because we don't know, we should accept what we do know. And when God says, look, you'll fail. You know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there is... Grace has been given to you, lest by any man that you know that any man should boast, but it is a work of God. And that grace is a work of God, not a done deal, but a thing that's being accomplished in you, both to do to will of his good pleasure, accomplishing in you what he wants to make manifest to the universe throughout eternity that, hey, look at them. I saved them. Yeah, they were a screw up big time. <laughs> and they were like, you know, dumping and chumping, but you know what? I made them into something. You know, that dump chump became something. <laughs> No, but really, no, really became something. Something that I could use, that I wanted in my kingdom. And so when you look about and you see people talking about each other or stomping on or romping on or chomping on some believer or some Christian or some other person, walk away. 
They don't know what they're saying. They don't know what they're doing. They're failing. They've already failed the first test of love, which is, would you, in all reality, say that to Jesus face to face? In other words, if you can't tell Jesus to his face what you're telling some other Christian, shut up. Shut up. Because God's putting up with your quote-unquote you know, pride, but you're failing. The number one test is love, and by this shall they know me or my disciples indeed, and that you have love for one another. What kind of love is it when you're pointing out somebody's fault? Beating on them, chomping on them, stomping on them. That ain't working, is it? Let me know how that works out for you. How many disciples have you made lately? Huh, really? You know? Even Jesus warned the Pharisees and the scribes that you make them, you find for yourselves and you search the world over those that would follow you, and then you make them twice as fit for hell by what you do. And he warned them of that kind of righteousness and that kind of holiness and that kind of perspective. So Jesus said, I don't want to have nothing to do with you. You go do your righteousness. And let me know how that works out for you when you talk to my Father in heaven. But I want to go to the people who are hurting. I want to go to the people who want something. The people who need something. The people who reach out and want to become something. And that's what God wants all of us to recognize in this false teaching of this, you know, don't let them fail or that you're, you're being made perfect. Forget the past, you know, and just go on with the future. Hey, I'm going to remember my past. I'm going to remember every failure I made. You know what? Because God's going to forget it eventually. Cast in the sea of forgetfulness. But the point is, it brings me to a realization of how merciful He is, how loving He is, how long-suffering, how much grace I've been given so that I can extend grace. So I don't forget my past. I allow my past to remind me of the things that God is doing that will last. And those are the things that go on into eternity. The mercy, the love, the loving kindness, the gentleness, the meekness, the temperance, the perspective of knowing that it's not these things that did or I did in the past that will last, but it's the things that God has placed inside my soul those emotions and devotions to Him that are going to be the reality I take into eternity to be with Him. And so I need to grow that up inside of me. I need to become more likened unto Thee, O Lord, but unto, you know, not me, but He, and to find out what He is like, being that God is love, then everything you do should be looked through that prism and to see what's a manner of actions you're doing. Are they doing them and focusing yourself in on the love of the person? Or are you really just loving yourself and elevating yourself above other persons? That's why we don't choose to judge one another. That's why we don't, we could, that's why we choose not to chastise one another, so to speak. That's why we choose not to, you know, bring into this really strong discipline, you know, the bliss of an area that a lot of people out there want to be. You know, they're going to point it out, you know, and then throw them out and kick them out and do all these things that they think that they've got the freedom to do in the book of, you know, whichever book you want to pick, you know, where they started throwing people out of the church. Uh, you be careful there. You may want to read the context again and then start with Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and then go from there, whether God tells you to do these things or whether you're doing them on your own accord. There's no offense. God may save that person to the uttermost and the extreme most with which he even told Paul, look, you may have gotten rid of Mark, but I got a work for him to do. And sure enough, down the road, even Paul accepted Mark back. And that's why the learning process is so challenging, and I always like to bring up the Peter principle in it. Peter today would have been thrown out of every church and would have been told that he was you know, a heretic and would not have been allowed to develop into the person that he became, which was mighty in the Lord. And that's one of the things we have to recognize. Any person can be a Peter. Any person can be a Paul. Any person can be a Jesus. Any person can be any of the disciples. We need to let each other fail so that we can let God succeed.